And this is in uh, preparation for Dr. Steinman. So do you use grafts or patches for rotator cuff augmentation? Which of the following are indications in your practice for considering the use of a graft or a patch? And then in preparation for Dr. Cole, how many times have you used PRP for rotator cuff augmentation? <clears throat> Let those results start to come up. Looks like we've got 65% uh, or so have never used a patch. Some have considered it in uh, chronic massive tears. And PRP, the vast majority of us have not used PRP. A uh, few of us, about 21% have used it, but less than five times. So it'll be interesting, Brian, during your talk. Let's go now to Scott Steinman uh, from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Scott is a uh, leading innovator in shoulder and elbow surgery and is going to share his thoughts on patches for massive cuff tears. And remember, Scott, Evan Flato says it's not a bicycle tire. That's true, and it's like the unchuggable beers are really unrepairable rotator cuff. Well, as we, as we saw in the, uh, in the survey, uh, it was interesting uh, that uh, no one is, uh, thinks or has used a patch for a medium or small, small tear. So we're really looking at uh, using this in the, in the larger ma massive tears, particularly in a situation where you get in there's, and there's actually no tissue left. And I think the area that, that this may have a role is in those patients that have a massive tear have good muscle. I think we, we need to remember that the muscle is a very important part. If you have beyond grade three or grade four changes, and most of the supraspinatus has been turned to fat, uh, that uh, I don't think any patch or anything is really indicated in that, in that uh, situation. Uh, my disclosures. Uh, and again, this is the problem. You have a, a patient like this who has a, a subscap tear, have a, 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 a grade three changes, and uh, supraspinatus retracted to the glenoid. It might look like this. This is a revision case that I did not, not too long ago. You know, very large cuff tear. You see the remaining sutures. You need some tissue to kind of fill, fill the gap in these, in these patients. Well, historically, uh, everything's been tried, including Gore-Tex and Dacron and Felt, and initially with fat, fascia lata. In 2006, this is sort of the menu that you had, had then, and it's been, the field's been growing since then. A lot of the xenografts were based on porcine and the intestinal submucosa uh, graphs that actually were very quickly uh, resorbed, and there were a lot of uh, questions with uh, allergic responses and questions of is it infected or is it not infected, which is something you really don't want to try and figure out on your own patients. And then those that uh, were, were actually processed and cross-linked. I think one thing that we're, we've seen uh, in the literature uh, in the studies is that cross-linking of the graph itself decreases its bio-incorporation. The cross-link is, is looking not to be a good thing in a product that you're looking at. And also, a lot of the, the dermal products, particularly the uh, ones that are derived from allographed human dermal products, are actually not sterilized. And they're harvested in aseptic fashion, so there's that theoretical possibility of disease transmission. Uh, in 2010, the, the menu's gotten, gotten bigger. We have uh, different, different graphs, including uh, horse pericardium. There's been an increase in the porcine uh, dermal grafts, and, uh, and you can see there's actually about four human dermal grafts on the market market now. And uh, you can see some of the additional ones, uh, some, uh, and uh, you can see the, the uh, increase in human dermal uh, grafts that we have uh, available uh, currently. It's interesting, how do these grafts actually respond to tenocytes? Because that's really what we're looking at. Do these things actually grow into, or do tenocytes actually grow into these? This is a, a short, interesting study looking at various uh, uh, products uh, that were cultured with tenocytes, and essentially only the, the dermal grafts, um, human dermal grafts, and the porcine dermal graft actually uh, had some uh, tenocytes actually uh, attached to them, implying, I guess it's a, it's a bit of a leap of faith that you would think that a rotator cuff uh, tenocytes would grow, would grow into that also. But interesting, those that were equine or synthetic really had no tenocytes attaching to them. Well, how can these graphs help us? This is a study that Alan Barber did, just showing what might make common sense, but other studies have shown this too, that uh, if you put an augmentation graft on, the load and ultimate failure is higher with the graft in incorporated. 
We did a, a study uh, here at Mayo looking at uh, incorporation in an animal model using a dermal graft. And here you can see at three months, native cells of the dog, and in this case, it's human tissue in a, in a dog, so it's a xenograft, uh, so to speak. Uh, and you see incorporation of, of uh, the dog's uh, cells incorporating into the graft itself. And the graft itself histologically or grossly uh, showed incorporation. And then the strength at six months was essentially similar to uh, control. A similar study done in the rat model, also uh, using the same dermal type graft, showed very similar increase uh, in, in strength in those that actually were grafted versus those that were left uh, not ungrafted. I'll show you some examples uh, that we've done of, of grafting. This is an unfortunate 46-year-old, two previous attempts to repair open. And then we went ahead and, uh, and grafted that. We can see kind of like pulling, the, uh, pulling it tight over like the, I pull it tight sort of like, the, like, the, like a snare drum, very tight over the, over the uh, repair that's underneath. And uh, he did well. He actually sent me his mother who had bilateral cuff, cuff tears. I don't know what happened here. There's a 16-year-old with a massive cuff tear after two previous debridements. I'm not sure what the previous surgeons actually, actually did. But to try and reconstruct her, we, we used a graft. And she actually went on to uh, keep her uh, hockey uh, scholarship. Uh, her motion actually was only about 90 degrees. This is a case I did uh, uh, Friday, actually. There's a revision mass of cuff tear. You can see the edge of the, the supraspinatus and the footprint uh, in, in yellow. And we got it repaired, as you can see. But it was, I was not happy with the strength. It was a transosseous repair. So we did, did a graft, again, uh, uh, unloading some of the native uh, repair that we did by, by stretching this graft tight over the repair that, that we did previously. Again, we'll have to see how that patient ultimately, ultimately does. This is a subscap repair that we did. And it was interesting uh, for a total shoulder. I had the opportunity to go back two years later for a reverse. And I harvested the, uh, the area center for biopsy. And uh, the staining we did was for, uh, for um, elastin staining. And you can see the elastin in there and the incorporation in this uh, new, new subscap tendon, so to speak. So we, you can see that it does tend to, at least in these anecdotal reports. And Steve Steiner and others have, have sampled anecdotally some of these, these patches down the line. And they do so, show some incorporation of native cells into the, into the patient. Speaking of uh, Steve Snyder, the arthroscopic technique uh, he has really pioneered. Uh, it, is, it is not the easiest technique in the world. You see, it just doesn't just pop right in, as I'm showing there. But uh, when you have many different sutures pass through, and you really have to have the skill set of Steve Snyder. And, and we have a lot of experience in arthroscopy to, to make this work. In Steve's hands, it's about two and a half hours. Uh, in my hands, it's about three hours. So I, I tend to do most of them now uh, as a mini open, mini open approach. It's interesting, though, this is a study that, uh, that, that uh, Alan Barber and uh, Steve and uh, Joe Burns and Alan Deutsch did uh, and showed, actually, by MRI at, at uh, over a year that the augmented group that they did arthroscopically, these are all, all expert arthroscopists, showed intact cusps in 80, 84% versus 46 that were not, uh, not augmented. So again, this is not a, not a prospective uh, study, but we need, uh, I think, some more studies uh, prospectively. Steve himself has done over 100, 100 patients. Uh, and in his most recent uh, report, uh, on looking at 45 patients uh, with, without an MRI, but looking at validated uh, scores and increased UCLA, Western Ontario, and ASES score. But again, these, these were not, uh, not looked at by MRI. He had an earlier study of, of 16 patients uh, that had an MRI follow-up, and 13 out of 16 massive tears were still repaired at, at uh, over a year, year follow-up. And here you can see example. The graft is obviously thin, as you can see here. Uh, but th these are patients uh, that were done uh, of Steve's at, uh, over the three-month three, three, month, uh, three month mark. And you can see one uh, failure there. So how, how does this, this work? We, we, we need more studies. We have uh, just some of these uh, uh, case series of Steve Snyder, um, Buzz Burkhead, and, and others. And, and perhaps it, it works by making uh, sort of, as Chris was talking about, sort of a watertight environment to allow a, a interposition uh, maybe between the uh, humeral head and the acromion. And, uh, and also, uh, perhaps uh, by uh, increasing the, the biomechanical forces between the subscap or the anterior aspects of the rotator cuff to the posterior aspect, sort of like a boutonniere deformity in, in the finger, uh, perhaps that also helps biomechanically uh, with these patients. But again, we really need to study this, uh, study this much, much more. I think, I think the graphs will have a role if you have def deficient uh, tendon tissue, but you have good muscle. And admittedly, that's rare. As you get to the massive tears, you get past grade three changes in the muscle. 
and, and even just trying to suture in these patches really does not work. Uh, we have animal studies showing that these, these do work well in the animals, but again, this is taking healthy young animals, like taking 12-year-olds, cutting out a hole in the rotator cuff and putting a patch in. As we know, that's not how rotator cuff tears really, really occur. And we do know that biomechanical studies to augmentation definitely increases strength at time zero, but does that in, 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 continue over time during the healing period? And Steve Snyder certainly has showed uh, excellent results in his series. And again, this is difficult to do arthroscopically. We need more, uh, more centers doing prospective uh, studies. And uh, as an aside, I think we need to slow down our, our post-op uh, therapy to allow for cuff, uh, cuff healing. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Scott. That was a terrific, a nice review. Um, you know, I think it's important to, to keep in mind, and, and I've uh, read Steve's paper that you highlighted there, that is not a peer-reviewed article, uh, and that was a technique article in which they, they published some of their, uh, his early results, and I think it's important for our viewers to keep that in mind. So he is an expert surgeon and, and certainly is one of the few people in the world who's pioneered this, and it's exciting, but we, uh, we certainly are awaiting uh, some, uh, some more peer-reviewed literature to really look at that a little bit more carefully. Yeah. I think that's the key. Is we, the bottom line is we have very little literature on the use of these uh, products. That's really the bottom line. Lisa, any, any role in your practice for the use of, of graphs or augmentation of any type? Um, I don't use them routinely. I think young patients uh, where they have very little chance of healing on their own and you really need something, it's certainly worth a try. Um, I do inform my patients, I think, to a large extent, use of these products is still experimental. Um, but, you know, especially, for example, the 16-year-old hockey player with a massive tear, I mean, that's someone that it's very reasonable to do that in. I think some of the research is very compelling. Um, but certainly younger patients with larger tears who are still of working age would be patients that I would consider it in. And uh, Brian, have you used it in your practice? <clears throat> I don't. The times that I've thought about using it have been the, the rare individual who has good quality tissue, no other explanation for failure, and coming in for revision. And I've, I've chickened out more times than I've actually used it because I just say, you know what, this just the tissue quality is so good, I'm just going to go ahead and re-repair. But that's the time that, for me, where I've been most provoked, where I can't find any other good reason for failure and thinking about some type of augmentation. Thanks. Scott, can, just give us a, a quick uh, a, a sense of the cost uh, for the, the uh, augmentation or the patch that you're using. We, we have we have a, a discounted rate, but it's you're talking between two thousand and five thousand dollars. So, this is something also if you're doing this in a surgery center that you have a financial interest in, uh, this is going to cost more than uh, a lot more than the anchors that you're going to be using, and, and significantly increase the cost. Uh, Chris, what are your thoughts as a, a an engineer uh, thinking about patches and and how they work and what their potential use is? Well, one of the interesting aspects of some of these tears that we that we don't always consider is that what's happened to the native tendon. And we pay a lot of attention to what the muscle quality is and what the muscle atrophy is, but oftentimes there's minimal tendon to work with. Sometimes when you're passing sutures and you feel like you're getting some tissue bite, you're just going into the muscle that is just medial to what is very limited tendon tissue. So I think in the setting where you have muscle that's uh, going to act as a real muscle tendon unit but is deficient of tendon, there is a role for that for augmenting. And we know that if we just make it a simple tissue bridge, uh, as Scott's shown, it may not restore muscle function directly, but it may have some, uh, some assistance with, say, preventing boutonniere deformity or getting some of the uh, lateral muscles. And, uh, and the force couple working, if you can bring the force couple back into play, even though it's a superior construct. So I do think there's a role uh, from a mechanics standpoint. Great. Thanks a lot. You know